This program is made possible by the support of Delta Dental, Quick Trip, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Hospital Association. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wisi.org. person instruction since the beginning of the school year. In the first round of these discretionary funds in the CARES Act, about $46 million was sent by the governor to school districts not based on in-person learning. We've seen a large amount of these funds go to districts that have provided little to no in-person instruction during this school year. Some of them have not even applied to receive that funding according to the latest information we have from the Fiscal Bureau. Districts that are providing in-person instruction have additional cleaning costs, transportation costs, staffing costs, and other costs that the districts not in person do not have. The in-person districts could use this money and would show we are prioritizing in-person education, which we know is best for students and families. Uh, a few of my colleagues are going to talk about the importance of this issue, uh, beginning with uh, Representative Rodriguez. Thank you, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Jesse, Representative Jesse Rodriguez. I represent the 21st Assembly District. And uh, last month we held a hearing uh, to talk about uh, some of the uh, uh, funding that was coming to the state, federal funding that was coming to the state. And we had some parents talk about their experiences uh, with virtual schooling and their, their, the, their children's struggle with that. And I personally have an experience like that with uh, my elementary school uh, uh, child. Um, he's, he was uh, a, a, in, per, in virtual schooling for the last, the end of uh, the previous school year and a portion of this current school year. And now that he is back, he is excited to learn. He is more motivated and he is really excited to be with his friends. And this, as parents, this is what we want for our children. We want our children to be happy, uh, to uh, continue with their education, low, reducing the achievement gap. And we also know that there are uh, um, health benefits with our children being in school. So the best place for our children right now is in the classroom. There is more data worldwide and also within our state that show that there is a greater benefit of having our children in school versus um, virtually. Schools across Wisconsin have shown that over the past year, uh, in-person learning can be done safely. According to the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, children ages 0 to 19 years old account for less than 16% of all confirmed COVID-19 cases. A recent CDC study of 17 rural Wisconsin schools conducted in-person learning found only seven cases, and that is about 3.7%, were linked to in-school spread. This was 30%, 37% lower than the surrounding community. Data from the CDC also shows that children aged 0 to 17 years old make up 11.5% of cases in the United States. A number of um, new, the number, we have seen that the number of uh, new COVID cases has decreased. We're seeing more people being vaccinated. And uh, um, I think, and we've seen that school districts have been able to stay in person and doing it safely. And we haven't seen uh, the increased uh, positive cases as a result of that. And so um, we, today we are asking that the governor prioritize getting our kids back to school. The data is showing that it is safe to do so. And we're asking that he use uh, the additional funds that we're getting or that he is getting through the gear to, uh, to go to schools who are providing in-person instruction. As a result of providing in-person instructions, these schools, as was, has been mentioned, um, are doing their best to make sure their kids are safe by sanitizing and upgrading their uh, um, uh, heating system. So uh, we hope that the governor will listen to our thoughts and prioritize getting back to schools, uh, kids back to school, and use this funding to do that. Up next is Representative Duco. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Duco. I represent the 99th Assembly District. And I'd just like to give you an example as to why we feel the funding has been inequitable and we need the governor to step up and help out our schools. All the schools in my district have been in person and they've been doing a great job and our parents are thrilled to death. But they're not receiving the funding that some of the other schools are. 
MPS received $292 million. Think of that, $292 million. That comes out to over $4,000 per student. One of the schools in my district, Kettle Moraine, received $330,000. That comes out to $91 per student. Kettle Moraine has been in person, in the classroom since September. They have had to have extra PPE, extra custodial staff, extra nurses. They've rented outside classrooms. They've had extra teachers. They have spent over $2 million to put those kids in the classroom face-to-face -face so they can have the education they deserve. We need the governor to help schools like that out. They can't afford a $2 million hit to their budget because they aren't getting that sort of crazy money that some of these other schools are getting. So we're asking the governor to please step up Let's encourage people to go back to school. Let's get back to school full time, and let's help those people who've been doing it, doing it right all along. So thank you, and now I have Representative Thiensfeld. Good afternoon. I am Representative Jeremy Thiensfeld from Fond du Lac. I also serve as the chair of the Assembly Education Committee. And I'm speaking as someone who spent 22 years instructing students. I can tell you that the most important thing to me in all of those years was always what is best for the students. Clearly, what is best for almost all students is to be face-to-face -face with a teacher. This has increasing importance for our youngest students. Students are learning far more than facts and knowledge when they are in school, and they don't only learn from their instructors. They learn from each other through social interaction. They are learning how to handle personal relationships, how to read each other's facial expressions, body language, and emotions. They're learning appropriate decorum in the midst of others. They're learning how to interact, how to initiate, and how to respond. The benefits of in-person instruction are nearly endless, and almost none of it can be duplicated in front of a computer. I know of no one who disputes these facts. This is why some districts and private schools were willing to work so hard at the beginning of this school year to make sure that they could have in-person instruction. These schools recognized from the beginning what the CDC was so slow to tell us. The benefits of in-person education in a pandemic surpass the risks. These schools have re-examined and altered the logistics of nearly every aspect of a normal school day and in, or in order to maximize the education to their students. Some of the school day modifications were simple, but some were also extremely challenging and expensive. Months ago, I was contacted by the superintendents of Lamira and Hortonville, and also numerous private schools on the financial impact of keeping their buildings open in a pandemic. Here are a few examples. Large increases in substitute teacher budgets, which was already a tough battle before the pandemic. Additional costs for hand sanitizer and other sanitation equipment. Increased cleaning of buildings. Installation of higher quality ventilation systems. Smaller class sizes, therefore needing more instructors and as Representative Duco said, sometimes more buildings. Increased bus routes. High cost, frequent COVID quick testing results of faculty and staff. Upgrades in technology for students who who choose virtual learning and to quarantine. Increased needs for mental health practitioners, and there are more. Governor Evers, you often remind us that you are a teacher and are rightly proud of that. So am I. However, I struggle to understand why we would not reward those schools, teachers, and communities that have selflessly sacrificed, put themselves and their families at risk so that their students could receive a higher quality educational experience. The federal funds need to be prioritized to those who have faced the greatest risk and those who have borne the largest financial burden because of it. We should not reward those who have not followed the science and have only seen digital images of their students for many months. I turn it back to Representative Bourne. Okay, if there's any questions on the request we're making of the governor today, we could take them now. So with the, like, the city plan Milwaukee money, mm -hmm. that's dictated by federal policy. So you're being with the governor because that 
there's what, eight hundred some million dollars and sixty million dollars pot or something like that that can be divvied out by the state wanted to do with DEI. So your beef with the governor or the federal government, how is dictating this money? I wouldn't say anyone's having a beef here today. She's simply pointing out that the funds haven't been spread out in a way that focuses on the the need and the need right now for the additional financial burden that's placed on these districts are the ones that are in person and he has discretionary money available so we're just saying please use it and focus on the need which is the additional cost that you know chairman Thieswell just outlined a lot of examples of that um, so I don't think there's a beef with anyone per se it's just the request is the money's there invest it where the priority of, of the need is Use this in a COVID relief bill, separate legislation, or wait for the federal government, who is, you know, possibly going to pass another round of relief with education funding as a priority. Because uh, we don't have any say in what the, how the feds prioritize it, they put it in whatever formula and way they want to. Which, so far, as my colleagues have pointed out, did not focus on the schools that are spending the additional resources to run their schools safely. And we don't put it in a bill here because this is federal money that the governor has total control over. So there isn't really a, an ability for us to, uh, you know, legislate a way to use this. That's why we're asking him to prioritize this. And I think we've made you know, a good argument as to why this is a smart way to use this money on the schools that really need it. So would you say it's cheaper to do uh, virtual learning than it is to do in-person learning? Uh, I think that the cost of doing it in person is clear and these districts have, you know, are more than willing to lay out the costs that come with that. So I'm wondering what the end of the budget discussion about people funding. I mean, a lot of these formulas the federal government rely on uh, formula based off of kids and federal on Mm-hmm. The governor in his budget request wants to basically put more money in general school aid, right? A form of based on well in the district. Do you anticipate making decisions about school funding from the state that takes into account what we got the federal government in these packages and what you're talking about trying to compensate those other districts that have that in person because of what's going to federal government? Yeah, I think we'll have uh, you know as we always do broad discussions on the best way to invest in K through twelve education in the next couple of months and I think you'll see us looking for a variety of ways like in the past we've done uh, you know pure pupil special education uh, mental health and so certainly uh, in the current environment part of the discussion will certainly be additional costs that are brought into schools and in the pandemic all right everybody thanks for your questions This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 